Gentlemen, I am Colonel Hall, Director of Warning and Threat Assessments, Office of the Assistant Chief of Staff, Intelligence. In this air intelligence presentation, we have traced the development of the Soviet ballistic missile threat to the United States from its inception just after the close of World War II through the period ending 1 January 1960. We do not believe that the Soviet rulers imagined they can achieve decisive military superiority over the United States through the exploitation of a single weapon system such as the ICBM. However, we do believe they hope to exploit its capabilities as an integral part of a mixed offensive force, which together with other offensive and defensive systems will enable them to achieve decisive military superiority over the United States at the earliest practicable date. It is with this thought in mind that we have analyzed the development of the ICBM and the nature and dimensions of the threat it poses during the period 1960 to 1970. Your briefing officer is Lieutenant Colonel Joel Parks of my staff. Gentlemen, this air intelligence briefing is secret. This presentation will highlight some significant aspects of the development of the Soviet ICBM threat to the United States. To arrive at the firmest possible estimate of Soviet ICBM capabilities, we've analyzed the Soviet guided missile test program in great depth. Specifically, we've analyzed development of missile test ranges and associated research activities at Kapustin Yar where missiles up to 1,100 nautical miles are fired, and Tayur Tam, where ICBMs and space vehicles are launched. By 1 January 1960, some 21 ICBMs had been fired from Tayur Tam, impacting on the Kamchatka Peninsula, and on some occasions, the Pacific Ocean. But these do not represent all Soviet ICBM research and development testing, since their test program has been conducted continuously and energetically since 1947 at Kapustin Yar. The Ballistic Missile Division of ARDC has helped investigate those firings believed to have been related to ICBM development. The Kapustin Yar test range extends easterly from the Stalingrad area toward Lake Balkash. The range head is some 15 to 25 nautical miles east of the village of Kapustin Yar. Impact zones are at various distances, the furthest being about 1,100 nautical miles. Each zone is heavily instrumented with optical and electronic gear. Prior to the 1955 installation of the FPS-17 long-range radar at Diyarbakir, Turkey, and new ELINT intercept gear to record telemetry, we relied on sources of a lower technical reliability to provide information about the Soviet guided missile program. During 1958, coverage of the long-range radar was extended from 1,000 to 2,000 nautical miles, with several beams added to increase intercept possibilities. Generally, all firings at Kapustin Yar beyond the 600 nautical mile range can be picked up by our long-range radar. Another radar, operational since February 1959, has been constructed on Shimia Island in the Aleutians to detect Soviet ICBM firings. All Soviet ICBM and space shots since then have been detected, except one probable ICBM firing on 9 June 1959, when equipment was inoperative due to maintenance. Total firings at Kapustin Yar until 1 January 1960 are estimated at several hundred. This indicates a continuously progressive R&D program has been energetically carried on by the Soviets for 10 years or more. Evidence indicates that this has provided the Soviets with operational weapons of 200 nautical miles and less, 350, 700, and 1,100 nautical miles. Kapustin Yar has always been the workhorse range for Soviet ballistic missile development. Therefore, it must have been used for component testing and development for the ICBM before activation of the ICBM space missile test range at Tayura Tam. Geographic limitations of the Kapustin Yar range limit firings to about 1,200 nautical miles. These facts indicate that the Soviets would be forced to activate an ICBM test range, but its actual existence was not known until early 1957, when the range hit in the Tayura time area was discovered, and the impact zone was generally located in the area of the Kamchatka Peninsula. 
Good eland coverage of the Tyuratam Range Terminal was not effective until late 1957. But we believe the two ICBM firings in or before September 1957, announced by Khrushchev, were probably launched from Tyuratam so as to travel the full 3,500 nautical miles to the Kamchatka area. Judging from Soviet announcements, collateral reports, and computation of satellite orbits, Soviet Sputniks 1, 2, and 3 were launched from Tyuratam. Similar computations indicate that Lunik 1, 2, and 3 were also launched from Tyuratam. It is generally agreed that military missile components were used to launch all space vehicles. We have had good telemetry intercept on every Soviet ICBM and space firing since 30 January 1958, including the launch and re-entry phases of the ICBMs and the launching phase of space vehicles. The recordings indicate that similarly configured boosters are used for all of these firings. Four apparently successful 3,500 nautical mile ICBM firings were made at Tyura Tam in the relatively short time of January to May 1958. Initial component testing must have taken place at Kapustin Yar and other test facilities. Like our own test program, the Soviets must also test various components at lesser ranges before moving into the true ICBM test phase of 3,500 miles or more. Reentry data and stage separation are tested at both the shorter and the longer ranges. Telemetry intercept and ICBM firings shows considerable development in guidance and reentry body instrumentation as early as March 1958 and indicates the development program was in a late state even at that time. Therefore, it must have been preceded by a long and intensive test program with numerous flight tests of components. The intelligence community, together with the Ballistic Missile Division of ARDC, re-examined the cumulative data on the Kapustin Yar tests to find out how much of this initial ICBM testing was done with shorter range test vehicles during the past two or three years. The conclusions were that since mid-1956, the Soviets probably fired over 40 missiles to 700 nautical miles to test ICBM components. Many of the firings of the 1100 nautical mile missiles since mid-1957 probably had very close ICBM associations. The time correlation between firings of the 1100 nautical mile missile and the ICBM firings definitely pointed to a close relationship between the two. This, coupled with technical analysis and photography of the Sputniks, has led the Assistant Chief of Staff Intelligence, Air Force, to believe that the Soviets may have had a twin ICBM program, initially with a 700 nautical mile type of missile, and later with the 1100 nautical mile version. The latter missile is believed to have formed the main booster stages for Sputnik 3 and the Lunix. During 1957, 58, and 59, some nine vertical firings have been detected by Radiant and Elint. These were undoubtedly for upper air and pathological research. On at least two firings, nose cone separation tests were positively identified. Telemetry readout has confirmed Soviet statements that live animals have been ejected during some of these firings. These tests paved the way for the ESV program and included testing of equipment to permit recovery of components from high altitudes. This evidence of considerable R&D on their ICBM ESV program at Kapustin Yar substantiates belief that Soviet ICBM development has been energetically pursued for years and has now reached a highly advanced stage. The Soviet missile development program reveals that it introduces a new dimension to surprise and forces us to reassess our own strategic position and re-evaluate the Soviet's ability to deal a crippling blow. Most vital in this regard are their intercontinental and submarine launched missiles, since they can be brought to bear directly against the continental United States. Rapid development of ballistic missile and nuclear technology places at the disposal of the Soviet hierarchy a new order of destructive capability. The ICBM nuclear warhead system is beyond anything in our previous experience, because the speed with which the enemy can damage us is increasing, and chances of detecting his impending moves are decreasing. The attacker who can launch a large-scale surprise attack in a very short time now has a tremendous advantage which could well result 
in immediate destruction or paralysis of the victim's capacity to resist and prevent him from making a devastating counterattack. It could contribute heavily to the achievement of decisive military superiority.